Okay, the first thing I want to do is um, I think in retrospect that we'd be better off actually staying with SI units because um, the world seems to be moving in that direction. And in fact, there's a, there's a fairly nice way of, of dealing with the issue of SI units, namely that what you do is you say that Q squared over 4 pi x1 0 r is equal to E squared over r. And that's the E squared such that E squared over a bar c is 1 over 130, 436 if I remember correctly. And uh, so you get the you get the worst of the SI units out of the picture just by making that equality there, using that equality. And in fact, HR, SI units for the Hamiltonian are actually slightly nicer. Let me take off these long range glasses. Um, because the Hamiltonian 1 over 2m, just p minus qa squared plus q, uh, whatever the potential is, u uh, minus q over m s dot b. So this is the Pauli term, that last term. This is a term we derive for spinless relativistic particle in SI units. And of course, b is del cross a. And we're going to be in the radiation gauge as last time. And um, we're going to be taking A as minus a half R cross B, where this is a constant. And um, that A is in the radiation gauge and um, represents a constant magnetic field. And we saw that last time we saw that P dot A, which is also A dot P, is um, one half P dot L, where of course L is the orbital angular momentum R cross P, and that R is the distance between the electron and the proton, and P is the um, P is that complicated relative relative momentum. And U M here is really the reduced mass. Um, and so what we find is that um, H then is, in fact, let me just, well, I'm not going to skip that many steps. H is then P squared over 2M uh, minus P squared over R, and then minus Q over 2M L dot B minus Q over M S dot B and then plus Q squared over 2M A squared. And as I mentioned earlier, the Pauli term already includes a gyromagnetic ratio of the electron that's twice that, the spin part that's twice that of the orbital part. And uh, so the spin angular momentum interacts with the magnetic field twice as much as um, as the orbital angular momentum. This comes out of the Dirac equation. Does that mean we understand it? I'm not sure. I don't have an immediate explanation for it. What is a squared? Well, a squared is then going to be a quarter r cross b squared. And so this is a quarter, say, r cross b sub i squared, the i component. Let me use the summation convention now. OK, we sum over repeated indices. And i goes from 1 to 3. So this is 1 quarter epsilon i j k epsilon i l m r j b k r l b m okay that's 
that's because, um, for example, in this case, I would buy a special one I, J, K, or J, P, K, some double J and K. Okay, so now there's a standard relation for this, namely, when you have two epsilons and you're summing over I, over, over the index I, with J, K, and L, M uh, sitting there, we're also summing over J, K, and L, M, but in particular, two of the indices are the same. The rule is you write four deltas with a minus sign, and um, you write them this way, J, K, J, K. These are the first indices. Then you take the second indices and you write them like this, L, M, M, L. So this is an identity, which one should prove in, in um, linear algebra courses. And what does this tell us? This tells us that there's a JLKM term, and that gives us one quarter uh, R squared P squared. And this one tells us there's a JM term, and that is then minus R dot P squared. So that's what that expression is. And now, um, so as not to make life difficult for ourselves, we're going to take B pointing in the Z direction. Um, and uh, if B is in the Z direction, then this thing is one quarter B squared times R squared, or R vector squared, minus R sub Z squared. And so this is just one quarter, and this is just B squared over 4 times x squared plus y squared. Um, this exhibits very clearly a fact that um, might be a little bit puzzling when you derive the deal with the action and then the Hamiltonian for a non-relativistic or relativistic charged particle. It's that this A has within it the position operator, the quantized position operator, and so when you take a squared, bingo, what you've got here is x squared plus y squared, which are these quantum operators. So now, um, what one does still in SI units, we introduce the four magnetons, which is q h bar over twice the mass of the electron or I think it's more probably the reduced mass of the electron. But anyway, that's what we're dealing with. And this is approximately 9.27 times 10 to the minus 24 joules per tesla. And just to get an idea of what a tesla is, the, the highest magnets that people are able to make are roughly 10 tesla. I don't know, maybe, maybe these days one can get a little bit beyond that with some, some superconducting magnets, maybe you can get to 20 Tesla, I don't know. But I don't, I'm, I'm pretty certain we're not getting anywhere near a thousand Tesla. Um, so in this case then, the Hamiltonian, you see this Q over 2M is occurring all over the place here. Q over 2M here, Q over M, so this is twice that apart from the H bar. And so this thing is equal to P squared over 2M, minus e squared over r. And then there's another term, minus mu b over h bar, and one might as well write this as lz plus 2sz. Oh, I didn't do that in my notes. And the third term is q squared b squared over a m, and then x squared plus y squared. And the sensible way to think about this is that this h is equal to h0. We know the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian because we figured them out last time. And then plus h1, which is this stuff, and then h2. 
And it turns out for the sort of magnetic fields that one can make in the laboratory, let's see, I'm, I'm writing here in a, this is sort of a typo here, so let me just fix this. This is the Bohr magneton times the magnetic field. All right, so what we'll see in a, in a moment is that these energy levels, the ground state is minus 13.6 electron volts, and uh, as you go up, uh, the next one is, uh, remember there, these levels are EN minus 13.6 over N squared, and so for N equals 1, you have minus 13.6 EV, but for N equals 2, you have a 4 there, and so the gap between the the ground state in the first excitement, the n equals 1 and the n equals 2 levels, is something like 10 electron volts. And then the next one, n equals 3, has uh, uh, 3 squared, which is 9. And uh, so its level is about uh, 4. Anyway, anyway, they, they, they obviously get higher. It looks sort of like this. So eventually you get infinitely many of them. Um, but the gaps here are the order of an electron volt or, or a few electron volts. Uh, the gaps here will be down by about 10 to minus 4 for reasonable magnetic fields, strong, lab, strong, lab, lab scale strong, and this will be around 10 to minus 8 electron volts. This is why this is why quantum mechanics was adopted quickly in the early 20th century, because if one had instead a situation where um, this was 13.6, and this was maybe 20, and this one was 40 eV, then um, it might have been might have been slower. Stopping one of the All right. Now we know the eigenstates of this. They're um, N, L, M are the well, direct product with one half, and I wrote this in the notes as sigma z, with sigma z can be plus or minus one. Um, or plus or minus one half, I should say. Um, yeah, I guess I should. Um, well, that's the trouble. Sigma has eigenvalues of plus or minus one. Um, and uh, well, what do I mean? Yeah, I'm, I'm using plus or minus one. So the eigenvalues of sigma z are plus or minus one. Maybe I should call it sigma z prime is plus or minus one. The spin is, of course, plus or minus a half in the zero. Um, so these states are eigenstates of H0 plus H1. And um, the eigenvalues then are, I guess I might as well just say that H0 plus H1 on this state, uh, N, L, M, and then I'll just say plus or minus. The eigenstates of that then are minus a half M C squared alpha squared over n squared, that's the h0 eigenvalue, and then minus the Bohr magneton, the magnetic field, and then m plus or minus, uh, plus or minus, what I, what I call it, sigma c prime, or plus or minus 1, effectively. So if, if I'm calling it plus or minus, let me just call this plus or minus. Okay, so those are the, those are the, um, so we have the eigenstates of H0 plus H1, and um, the splittings then, uh, due to the magnetic field, are um, the ball magneton, the magnetic field, times m plus or minus 1. And notice here that this is the this is the z quantum number for the 
orbital angular momentum. This is twice the z quantum number for the spin angular momentum. And which just capitulates that H1 is of the form, is of this form, UB over H bar LZ plus 2 SZ. Now, how big are these terms? As I said, the PN0 minus a half N Z squared alpha squared over N squared minus 18.6 EV over N squared and PN0 over Planck's constant gives us frequencies of the order of 10 to 14, 10 to 15 hertz. So that tells you, by the way, the scale of radiation that can cause chemical changes, just roughly speaking, from the point of view of biology or medicine. If you're at or above this range here, 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 hertz, then a single photon can cause a chemical change. It could shift an electron from one level to another in hydrogen, or it could break a double bond and so forth. So that's basically the range. Does anybody know what the cell phone frequencies are? Actually, you've got a live laptop there, right? Can you do a Google cell phone frequency wiki and just see what the cell phone frequencies are? Because I think it's instructive to point out that cell phones are very unlikely to cause medical damage because the frequencies are so much lower. I think they're gigahertz range. There's no wiki article about this. You don't have a frequency for cell phones? Roughly? I've got one in my pocket. I can't imagine that it has that on the back. Verizon says no frequencies. That would be like the order of the energy to dissociate the electron from hydrogen? I think maybe 10 to the 15th might be. 10 to the 14th maybe is to go from the second to the third level or the third to the second. But that wouldn't say much about other bonds, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it does. It turns out... I mean, I don't want to say you've seen one out of you've seen them all, but the atoms of life are all... It's mostly hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, and then minuscule quantities of other atoms. And the energy levels of double bonds are typically five electron volts. There are lots of frequencies. U.S. is 1.9 gigahertz. 1.9 gigahertz. So this is 1.9 10 to the 9th, right? Giga is 10 to the 9th, right? So you see there's a huge gap here. There's 10 to the 5th just to the lower, just to this one. And so that means that instead of EV energies, you're talking about 10 to the minus 5 EV. And that can't affect the molecules. And so that's why I always start with that. I don't know who's behind it, but every couple of weeks there's an article about cell phones killing people, causing brain cancer. Okay, we mentioned that we had this four magnetons. 
Another way of thinking about that core magneton uh, is to say that the ball magneton, or minus the ball magneton, is 5.788 times 10 to, the, 10 to the minus 5 electron volts per Tesla. So um, there you see that, uh, that what in fact could be done by the by cell phone frequencies is you could uh, change the orbital angular momentum or, the, or you could flip a spin in a strong magnetic field. But um, so for a magnetic for a magnetic field of 10 Tesla, so U B times 10 Tesla in absolute value is something like 6 times 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. So as I said before, this, these eigenvalues of H1 are down by about 10 to the minus 4 from H0. And does flipping spin cause any form of radiation? Does it kind of cause any form of what? Like radiation. I mean, I know if you go... Well, radiation, the, yeah, but radiation, the, the, if you flip the spin of a molecule in a strong magnetic field, the radiation can be 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. But if you flip a spin where you don't have any huge magnetic field, but just have, say, a weaker magnetic field, then um, the amount of energy required to do that would, would be instead of um, instead of something like 10 to the ninth uh, hertz or 10 to the minus 4 EV for a strong field, it would be 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7 electron volts. And these then would be frequencies that instead of being up in the gigahertz range might be down in the, in the megahertz range, which is say FM radio, or even down in the AM band where you have kilohertz, between kilohertz and megahertz. We're all being shaken at 770 kilohertz by KOB. Um, um, so, so the ordinary electrons are sitting in the magnetic fields generated by other atoms. And other electrons, and those magnetic fields are such that uh, to flip a spin is something in the megahertz range. And um, and in fact, what people do with MRI is they have a magnetic field which they can vary, and so they can vary the amount of energy and therefore the frequency at which you which you need to flip a spin. And in fact, what they do. Actually, is they don't flip the electron spin, they flip the nuclear spin. And the reason for that is that the nuclear spin comes in with an NM here that's characteristic of the nucleus. So the frequency is down by a factor of a thousand or more. And um, that means that the radiation is even longer in wavelength. And the, the reason they like that is that those wavelengths don't get attenuated by passage through the body. And so MRIs, for example, are um, work on uh, or NMR, which is what it should be for magnetic resonance. Um, those machines were um, developed to flip the spin of the proton. Um, and it's basically they're flipping the spin of the hydrogen. And hydrogens everywhere in the, in the body and what what they learn by flipping the spin is that if the hydrogen is sitting in a particular chemical molecule then it's exposed to certain magnetic fields and the frequency isn't the same as as it is in H2 simply in the bottle H2 in a fat has a different frequency H2 in a protein a different frequency depending on the protein and so forth and so you can learn a great deal about what, what the concentrations are in different chemicals at different places in the body by 
knowing exactly what the frequencies are to flip the nucleus of hydrogen up and down. And um, anyway, that stuff was invented, I think, in the physics department at Harvard back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, something like that. Um, in fact, some of the, one of the people who did a lot of work on it was uh, Purcell. Edward Purcell who won the Nobel Prize in physics for, I don't know why, but he won it for some issue. Anyway. Um, and uh, when he was fairly, uh, when he was in his 70s or 80s, he had some sort of an injury, and some doctors realized that they were treating Ed Purcell, <laughs> wanted to use him as a kind of guinea pig, and, as I recall, he said no. He actually didn't like doctors. Um, uh, if that's another story. That's a big tension. If, if we're treating something that is very mathematical and you guys need a, a, a break, um, ask me what Purcell said to Berg when Berg asked to be a student. That's worth hearing. We've gone to by the way, just for future reference, one Tesla is 10 to the 4 gas. Okay. Um, so this, this UB times magnetic field times M plus or minus 1 in absolute value, these energies are less than or equal to about 6 10 to the minus 4 EB for a 10 Tesla field. Um, and to estimate the, the magnitude of these and to show that they're down by another factor of 10 to the fourth, we can just realize that the mean value of x squared plus y squared is of the order of the Bohr radius squared, and the Bohr radius is h bar over, this again is the reduced mass e squared squared, and uh, by the way, the Bohr radius. 0 0.52 angstrom. For some reason, they said 59. It might be 519, but it's roughly 52. Um, so the ratio of E2 over E1, where E0s are the eigenvalues of this, E1s are the eigenvalues of this, and E2 are the eigenvalues of this part of the Hamiltonian, which are then H2 over. H1, this is of the order of e squared, b squared, a0 squared over uh, the mass of the electron. That's the H2 part. I'm leaving out just ordinary numbers. 1 over the ball magneton times b. And um, so this is uh, the same as q squared, b squared, a0 squared over m times m over q h bar b and now I'm going to write this in one more thing q h bar b over m times 1 over h bar squared over m a0 squared now h bar squared over m a0 squared well, the mean value of P is essentially H bar over A0. That's just roughly the uncertainty principle in uh, a certain amount of hand waving. It's uh, H bar over that. So E0 is of the order of P squared over 2M, which is to say H bar squared over and a zero squared. So this thing here is E zero. So this is E zero. And um, the thing in the top here is QH bar over M, that's UB times B. So this is E one over E zero. So in other words, E two over E one is about the same as E one over E zero. So they're both factors of 10 to the month, 10 to the fourth. And 
The frequency, by the way, that characterizes these transitions here is called the long wall frequency. And so that's omega sub L. And unfortunately, I didn't write down that. I don't, there's a factor of two. So let me just say that the, roughly speaking, the long wall angular frequency is D dB over H bar. That's the, that's called the long wall frequency. There may be a factor of two, though. Or more. So that characterizes, the long wall frequency times H bar is roughly, is mu B times an integer. And it is roughly the energy of these H1 eigenvalues. Okay. Well, I think, I think that's enough. I've got another page of notes you can look on online. I've corrected the online notes and added the stuff about the long wall frequency, but I forgot to print it out. Okay, so any questions before we go on? The thing, the next thing to do is the, is to, is to place them all with the hydrogen atom. And in particular, see what we were doing here is a sort of perturbation theory. So I want to continue some more of that and then do stationary, do the rest of stationary state perturbation theory. But might as well see it in the context of physical examples rather than just, you know, gear it up as a huge mathematical theory. In fact, the part that's useful is obvious. And the part that's less useful is a little less obvious, but you can work that out. And then it's the part that is really not very useful at all, but it's really hard to work out mathematically. So anyway, so we're imagining then that we know the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian H0. And we'll say that each level has GN states and I that are degenerate. EGN are all with energy EN0. Okay, so I'm going to be looking at the degenerate and non-degenerate cases. First order, essentially the same way. I'll first do non-degenerate and degenerate. So now let's imagine that we have a Hamiltonian that's of the form H0. I wanted to write plus and I wrote zero. I don't know what that means. Plus lambda V. H0 plus lambda V. Lambda is a small dimensionless parameter. And so the energy levels then of the eigenstates, we can label the eigenstates with an index alpha. The eigenstates will be, we expect EN0 plus some delta E and alpha of lambda. And to first order, we expect that ENJ of lambda will be approximately EN0 plus lambda EN alpha 1. I'm not quite sure why I wrote J instead of alpha. I think this probably should be an alpha. 
Okay, so if, if n is, if gn equals 1, so non-degenerate case, non-degenerate level, then um, we can simply say h, then we can drop the index i for the level n. And this is equal to n h0 plus lambda v n. And since h n is an eigenstate of h0, we get e n0 plus lambda n v n. And in fact, we're done. So that's the that's what I meant by saying the important part of non-relativistic important part of perturbation theory is just obvious. Uh, and we have that result. So that's so we're essentially done. In other words, uh, E n one is just simply n lambda n. No, there isn't even any lambda. It's n v n. So well, that's the end of the non-degenerate case for first order perturbation theory. And so it's just, you just do the straightforward thing, take the mean value of Hamiltonian in each of its eigenstates. And the picture is that you have E10 here, E20 here, and E30 here. And then due to this perturbation, uh, this one gets shifted a little bit to here, this one gets shifted a little bit to here, this one gets shifted a little bit to there. And so these the corrected energy levels then are the EN zeros plus lambda times the mean value of the perturbation in the nth energy level. So that's that. Now, for the degenerate case, it's almost as simple. It's just that you have to remember that, that you know about linear algebra. And just as over here, we assume that the correction to this first state, to first order at least, was only going to involve the, the state, the eigenstate of the, the lowest eigenstate. It wasn't going to involve this, it wasn't going to involve the state two or the state three, it was only going to involve the state one. So to make the same statement here, you start out with, imagine you have, let us say, three levels, but each of these levels might be degenerate in different ways. But now we've got these levels, and now what you imagine is that the correction to each of these levels only involves these levels. In other words, the to first order, the change, the perturbation is going to mix these two levels and give you two new levels, but it's not going to involve any of these levels. And so what you say then mathematically is that the lowest order, the, the state n alpha is going to be a sum i equals 1 to g sub n of n i, n i, n alpha. So the fact that we've got n everywhere here means that we're only going to mix, if we're looking for the first order correction to one of the levels, to any of the, to all the levels, in the third set of levels, we only use the states in the third set of levels, which are these guys here. And so now, um, we just have the, the eigenvalue equation. And we'll say that this is H0 plus lambda V times, let me, let me go back to the summation convention. Just, so we're going to be summing over this index. Well, maybe it's better not. Anaheim, Anaheim, and alpha. And now H0 is an eigenstate of Ni, and so this is simply E0 plus lambda V times the sum Ni, Ni, and alpha. 
So the alpha means the eigenstate. This is our approximate eigenstate of H0 plus V. The Ni's are the eigenstates of H0, which are degenerate and all have energy E0 with respect to the operator H0. So now we take the matrix element of this with the level Nk, H0 plus lambda V, N alpha, and this is going to give us Wow, there's a big problem. That's right. It's going to be... We're going to say that this is... Let's see. We're... I guess... Did I skip an equation here? Oh, yeah. We're... We're going to say that this is... I skipped an equation. This is E1 N alpha times lambda. So in other words, our equation is going to be the Hamiltonian on the state is the Hamiltonian, and we're only expanding the states in terms of these degenerate eigenstates of H0, and we're going to say that is an eigenvalue of H0 plus lambda E1 N alpha on the state. And so now when we take the inner product with Nk, this is just a number, and we get E0 plus lambda E1 N alpha. Now we have Nk sum on I, N I, N I, N alpha. Of course, these guys are orthogonal because they're all eigenstates of H0. K is one of the G sub N indices that describe the degenerate levels, the different degenerate states in the nth level. And so in other words, Nk, N I is delta K I. And so this equation then becomes Nk, and of course, Nk being an eigenstate of this, this becomes Nk E0 plus lambda V, N alpha equals E0 plus lambda E1 N alpha, and this is then Nk N alpha. Now what we see is that this term, Nk E0 N alpha, occurs on both sides, so we cancel it. Then we cancel the lambda, and what we have is Nk V N alpha is E1 N alpha Nk N alpha. Okay. All right, so that's our equation. Now we insert, we once again say that N alpha is a linear combination of the Ni's, and we have the equation sum, let me just use exactly the same notation here. Okay, sum I equals 1 to G sub N, Nk V Ni Ni N alpha equals E N alpha first order Nk N alpha. Okay, this is then a matrix equation. We can define a matrix V I don't know where to put this sub N. V sub N, the matrix Ki, maybe I'll put an N on here. So V N Ki is N K V 
and I. So this is a square matrix. In fact, it's also it's a permission. It's a square permission matrix because V is a permission operator. And um, so what we've got is this matrix equation Vn times a vector psi is equal to E1 and alpha psi, where psi um, sub k, so I call this psi alpha. Psi alpha sub k is nk and alpha. So that's, um, that's what we've got to solve. And that's just uh, a first order linear algebra problem. And in fact, it's a nice problem because S is HV is a square emission matrix. So since that's a square emission matrix, um, what this is saying is that is that the matrix V N minus E one N alpha times the identity. So let me be explicit. This is the N, this is the G N by G N identity alpha matrix. So this is, this is the G N by G N square emission matrix V N. And so this combination of V minus the eigenvalue times the identity sends a vector into the zero vector, and that means that the determinant of Vn minus E1 N alpha equals zero. And um, that's a polynomial equation uh, in this eigenvalue, and then you can solve the I you can solve the polynomial eigenvalue. We always do that in physics. I don't know why we quite do that, but we say, okay, this is this equation. That implies that the term is equal to zero, so just solve this equation. Well, of course, that's that's kind of silly because if this were a 20 by 20 determinant, doing it with your fingers would be hell, and it would be a polynomial equation of 20th order, and you'd have to use some some approximate, some sort of approximation procedure because you can, you can solve quadratic equations easily. There are formulas for cubic equations, but they're not fun to use. I believe there are also formulas for quadratic equations and there aren't any formulas for quadratic equations. Beyond that, well, I mean, fifth order and beyond, you're, you're, you just have to use some sort of approximation procedure. Whereas, in fact, there are many, many linear algebra routines that will take a Hermitian, will take a Hermitian matrix, or just any matrix, any, any matrix at all, it doesn't even have to be square or Hermitian, and will find you, will do a singular value decomposition, and will find you these singular values. And if it's, in fact, a Hermitian square matrix, those singular values will be the eigenvalues. And uh, the singular vectors will be the eigenvectors. So going to this step is, I don't know, it's almost like going backwards, but we always do it in physics courses. Okay, in any event, one way or another, one finds the eigenvalues of this GN by GN matrix, and these eigenvalues are, are that are the are EN alpha one, and so the the eigen the eigenvalues of the Problem then, E n alpha are E n plus lambda E one n alpha. And now, um, what we started out with was G n degenerate states in this n level. Now, it could be that this V has G n different eigenvalues, in which case the degeneracy is completely broken. It may, on the other hand, be that this V has some symmetry in it, so that one or more of the, the two or more of these eigenvalues are equal, in which case the degeneracy will not be completely broken. 
find its perturbation. So let's see, we have time, we have more than time, to do an example of this, namely the Stark effect. Um, okay, so this was worked out in the 20s or 30s, well, not the 20s, late 20s, mid 20s, late 20s, 30s. Anyway, it's a hydrogen atom in E field. electric field in the z direction as usual. The potential is V minus Q, the electric field, the distance in the z direction. H0, of course, is P squared over, I don't see, I wrote, I, I wrote U in my notes, and that's not a bad idea. It, it emphasizes that it's the reduced mass, but it also, Separate, it also offers a distinction between the magnetic quantum number m and the mass of the electron. So this is the reduced mass of the electron I'm using u for that. Over there, I guess it's better to avoid u because we have u to the four magnitudes. All right, the eigenvectors of this, of course, are nlm. And we know the eigenvalues of that, so there's no point in mentioning them. The ground state of this, is it degenerate or not? Right, it's not degenerate. The ground state is N0, 0, zero and it's not degenerate. So the, we can use the first part of perturbation theory, the very simplest thing to say, 1, 0, 0 minus Q E Z, one zero zero. Now, what do you think this is? Well, let's do it. Let's do it. It's going to be an integral, some normalization factor, dq dr. It's going to be e to the minus a constant times r because the wave function or the uh, R100 zero zero is just e to the minus R over the Bohr radius. Or the Bohr radius over 2. Anyway, something like that. It's constant. And then we put Z here. And, uh, well, this is obviously 0. Because this is spherically symmetric, whereas here, in the upper, when Z is positive, you get a positive number. When Z is negative, you get a negative number. So the thing works out to zero. Equivalently, from the point of view of Z, this is an odd function, this is an even function. So there's no displacement to first order in the first level. <laughs> now something that um, I should have mentioned earlier is that if you take, if you consider the parity transformation, parity on X or R, minus x. So you flip the um, space components, multiply them by minus one, say. Um, that's called the parity operator. And um, clearly p squared is one because if you flip twice, you just back where you were. Well, p on NLM turns out to be minus one to the L times N L M. Uh, now, why, and how, do, how does one figure that out? Well, it's at least consistent with what we saw last time, namely that you could take for, you could take the N equals one, the L equals one states, take linear combinations of them, and make things that just went in the X, Y, or Z direction. In other words, they were e to the minus r over a zero times x, y, or z. And clearly under parity, this goes into, into minus itself. Um, it's generally true, though, that the YLMs, if you flip the, the if you do a parity transformation, the spherical harmonics are such that 
they go into minus 1 to the L. So, in other words, um, this is a transformation where theta goes to theta, goes to pi minus theta. And T goes to T plus pi. Under these transformations, Y, L, M, theta, and T goes to minus 1 to the L of Y, L, M. Or maybe I should just, instead of using these arrows, instead of stupid, I don't know what to do with that. So you said phi prime and theta prime like that, then this is a, an identity. <coughs> I I think I ought to prove that in class next time. But, um, I didn't really prove it today. In any event, um, by the way, this can be used to derive this result. This is equal to zero. And the way you do it is you say that, uh, in fact, this works not simply for the ground state, but for the state, um, well, let's just look at the state NLM, Z NLM, because that's what we have to deal with. And so you can insert here NLM uh, P, P inverse or P adjoint P Z and now um, Z inverse is minus Z over P inverse is also P adjoint. And so this is minus NLM P inverse P Z NLM. But P on NLM is minus 1 to the L, so this is minus 1 to the 2L times NLM Z NLM. Well, this tells us then that all the diagonal elements, in other words, minus NLM Z NLM. So this tells us that all diagonal elements of Z Zero. In fact, it tells us also that all NLM of just R NLM are zero because all components X, Y, and Z flip under parity. So, <coughs> so then, um, so we have those diagonal elements of zero. Now, if we look instead at the states two just for specificity because we, we finished we, there's only one state in the first level one zero zero so now let's look at two one m z two zero zero because we know that two zero zero z two zero zero equals zero so what is this going to be well it's going to be proportional to an integral d omega you know is integral over solid angles right the this state y two one m is going to be, have a y one m in it, but it's going to have a complex conjugate. Z itself is y one one no y one zero, and the ground state not the ground state the second any of the zero any of the s states is just a constant. Uh, in angular, I'm just look, doing the angular. There's also uh, r squared dr, but that's irrelevant here. Now, what do we know about this? We know that these guys are completely orthogonal, and so this is proportional to delta m zero. 
And remember that Y10 of omega is cosine theta, and that's – and Z is R cosine theta. So, in fact, this is actually on Q and R squared or R2 squared. Well, it would be R2 one times – to put in all these things, these are irrelevant. R2 one, R2 zero. They're real, so I don't need to worry about complex conjugation. So the perturbation then, V for the second level, the matrix, is – has zeros on the diagonal because we learned that all the matrix element of Z, diagonal matrix element of Z are all zero. And we can imagine then that this level is for the 2, 0, 0. This is 2 – now let me get this right because – right. I've got my notes here. I'm going to call this gamma E, gamma E, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. But I want to get these states right. These – oh, I was wrong. That's not 0, 0. It's in fact that this is – all right, I've written these states. This is 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, minus 1. And this one is, I guess, 2, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0. So we can write it this way. And so the eigenstates then are 2 plus, which is 1 over root 2, and it's the state 2, 1, 0, plus 2, 0, 0. And the state 2 minus, which is 1 over root 2, 2, 1, 0, minus 2, 0, 0. So in other words, the – remember the 2, 0, 0 state mixes with the 2, 1, 0 states – 2, 1, 0 state. But the 2, 1, 1 over 2, 1, minus 1 gives us 0 because of this condition of double counting. So this result reduces to a 2 by 2 off-diagonal matrix, and the eigenvectors then are the – or look like that. And this gives us an energy gamma E and minus gamma E. And this gamma is the following, that this is equal to gamma. So in other words, 2, 1, M, Z, 2, 0, 0 is gamma delta M, 0. And with that gamma, then you have these two energies here. Okay, so this is called the linear Stark effect. Linear because – linear because it's linear in the electric field. So it's first linear in Z, first order perturbation theory. Okay, any questions about that? All right, I don't know if I can actually start higher order perturbation theory. But if we do, the idea is this. We have the eigenstates of the simple Hamiltonian. Let me write them like that. And we're looking at the non-degenerate case. And we want to find the eigenstates of H0 plus lambda V 
approximately. We want to find them as power series expansions in lambda. So power series expansions in lambda. And we have an H0 plus lambda V on the state N. We want that to be in N. That's what we're looking for. And we'll say the delta sub N is equal to E sub N minus EN0. So this is the shift from the energy eigenvalues of H0 to the exact energy eigenvalues of this more complicated Hamiltonian, which involves both the dimensionless small parameter lambda and this permission operator V. So rewriting that a little bit, we get H0 plus lambda V on the state N, which is ENN, is equal to delta N plus EN0 N. And this gives us an EN0 on both sides. And so we can rewrite it as EN0 minus H0 on N is equal to lambda V minus delta N on N. So what we've done here is we've really just screwed up this equation something awful. We've taken the H0 N and subtracted it from both sides. Then we've taken the delta N and subtracted it from both sides. Then we've changed the sides, and we get this equation. This actually gives us, even though this is such a simple manipulation, it gives us a, it would have been better for me to write it without transposing the sides, but it gives us an immediate result. Namely, it gives us this result. N0, EN0 minus H0 N This, of course, is zero because N0 is an eigenstate of H0 with eigenvalue EN0. So this is equal to zero. But by using this equation, we get N0 lambda V minus delta N is equal to zero. And so that is that is a that's sort of an immediate result. And that tells us that, for example, in a previous equation, this equation, we can't just invert E0, EN0 minus H0. And we can think of this as an operator. We can say, well, multiply by its inverse, and then you get a formula for that. Well, the fact is that this has a zero eigenvalue in this vector space. And so we can't just invert that. All right. Well, I think this is a good place to stop since we're at the end of the hour in any case. And it goes on in a somewhat technical way beyond here, which is worth doing. But I think in the middle of this derivation next Monday, I will tell you the story of Bergen himself, which is actually quite instructive. Okay. So I guess we're done. Are there any questions? What about the homework? I've got two of your homeworks, maybe. Okay. Thank you.